Yes, yes you are. Well, you're, you're in, right. the, yes, you're in you the thing. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Okay. So I guess I can start sharing my screen unless you want to do some introduction or something else. Oh. Yeah, oh, let's, just, let's empty the stage for a second. And just one last little thing. Uh, if you do have any comments or you'd like to continue the discussion, we have a channel in the Q&A section for the diversity and paleo discussion. Yes. So anything, like, feel free to talk in there, discuss, um, just keep it civil. And we'll move on with our presentations. Yep. Okay. Sharing the screen. Hopefully it works. Apologies, my computer is a literal dinosaur. <laughs> so, uh, can you see it? The things I, the, the it's presentation. loading, it's loading. Yes. Yes. Is it on? There we go. Yay! Yep, I see okay. it too. <laughs> so, Perfect. hello guys. Today I'll be talking about the paleontology of Poland, which is the country I'm currently working in. Uh, I decided to do it because I just got a position at a uh, pig. Which is not very nice abbreviation, but means uh, Polish uh, uh, Institute of Geology, which makes a well, not very catchy uh, name in uh, English language. Uh, I'll be going about history, history of Poland and history of paleontology, and also prehistory of Poland. So it will be a double whammy. Okay, so let's go, uh, start going. Poland is set on European flatlands. So after glaciers moved out, all of area Asia became almost completely flattened, and that means. You have not a lot, a lot of exposure, a lot of anticyclonic conditions in weather, and it leads to a lot of severe lightnings. And you might be wondering, how does that feature into pantheology? Well, early Slavic people thought that the main god looking at them was god of uh, lightning, Spiron, and that god of lightnings manifested as a fossil, actually as a belonite, which is a usually Mesozoic squid. Uh, but those bell nights were thought to be uh, lightning bolts as they struck uh, the soil and where uh, some early people were buried with those bell nights surrounding them. And that legend, despite being from pre-Slavic, pre-Christian uh, Poland, still lives on. So when I was growing up, I was collecting those things and we were told that they are the lightning bolts and you should keep them for the good luck, they protect you from lightning. And that's the first foyer into pantology in Poland. Uh, later, of course, that's not just something related to folklore, an actual paleontology. The same with this thing. So, Vistula River collects all of Ice Age uh, animals going through it. Like here, you can see a bit of a whale, a head of a rhino. But when they were washed up next to the uh, castle in Krakow, which used to be Polish capital, they thought they belonged. It belongs to prehistoric smok, a uh, dragon, uh, that was slayed by uh, a, a witty knight, and sort of that represents the. Uh, <laughs> that hill, the battle hill that sits on top of a dragon cave. Of course, those things are just random chimeras of a mammal, but the legend still stays, and we go to the castle, those bones are hanging, and the legend is, if you want to destroy Polish state, you should just uh, cut those ropes open, let the bones fall, and Poland would collapse. So if you want to start a war and destroy Poland again, here's a quick way of doing it. Not recommending it. But the problem is, like, why do we don't have out of pantology in Poland? Well, when the, uh, a lot of Western Europe sort of clicked and had enlightenment uh, about uh, sciences and paleontology in particular, they also had a lot of thoughts going uh, on about colonialism and decided to uh, invade things close to them and start the further away. And that happened to Poland, more or less. Uh, in the late 18th century, Poland was occupied or partitioned by three empires, the Russian Empire, the Prussian or German Empire, and uh, Austro-Hungarian Habsburg Empire. And it disappeared for almost over 100 years. Uh, this is a bad news for a lot of reasons, because you're not allowed to use your language and other things, but also you cannot do science with another region. You became a border state that's kind of turbulent with war, uh, and also if you're a border state, nobody wants to really invest that much into developing cities, developing research, developing universities. Uh, and that meant during the European boom of pantology, Poland wasn't literally on map to actually do something with it. After World War I, Poland got its first nation state uh, after uh, more than 100 years of just not existing. Uh, and uh, it was a very troubling state. It went into war with Ukraine, it went into war with Lithuania, it went to war with uh, Bolsheviks uh, of Belarusia, and it had disputed city with Germany called Danzig, which is now Gdańsk. But despite these turbulences, first uh, institute of paleontology was developed and first museum in this neoclassical building I'm currently in, I'm currently working in, which was made in style of a uh, British museum. So you had those uh, elevated galleries, it's set up like a, 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 with a lot of windows above head, so it looks very like something you might find in Oxford. So that was the first collectivized collection of Polish stuff, uh, uh, Polish artifacts, and first way of showing it to the public. 
So we're coming to Pantology much, much more delayed than other of our neighbors in uh, Western and even some parts of Eastern Europe. But uh, Poland existed for those few uh, tens of years and was invited again by Germany, Austria, and Russia, but this time on their Soviet Union. Uh, I was almost partitioned back to the, the way it was previously. And that invasion was pretty severe. It was very nasty, it was very ethnicity based, uh, and uh, with a lot of hate to certain religious groups, like a uh, Jewish minority. Uh, at the start of the war, also a lot of Polish and Jewish intelligentsia, or people at higher stages, but also social workers, researchers, academics, teachers, were targeted, usually by the Nazis, to be destroyed, to not re-establish Polish state. They even had a big list with all academics that to be executed during the first days of war. And sadly, that happened in Poland, and when you go to the main museum, uh, you'll find lists of tens of people that were murdered in concentration camps, public shootings, Polish, Jewish, and associated uh, uh, working within the field. Some also died peripheral uh, deaths during the bombings in uh, Warsaw. Uh, but sadly, entire generation of academics was lost. But it was not as severe as it is. Although you look at this list, it's almost over 10 people. Uh, there was one scientist from the Nazi German government that was uh, asked to supervise uh, the geology in the Nazi occupied regions. Uh, and that Nazi was kind of a little bit like a Schindler character. So he was very cold, very aggressive, and of course uh, wearing SS uniform. Uh, but he protected all the Polish and Jewish academics. He even allowed Jewish families to hide in the museum uh, and uh, protected some researchers to go into the concentration camps, saying he really needs them because they know the, the region better. Uh, after the war, he was captured by the Soviets and put in a prison, but he protected himself in the court by speaking Polish and having uh, other people saying like, this guy was not as, uh, he was a Nazi, but he did not help more people within uh, the geology department. So he was left uh, to go scot-free and he established some universities and research groups in Turkey out of all places. So quite complicated history within the Polish Geological Institute. Feel free to ask me afterwards if you want some papers about people that have perished and more about uh, Professor Berkman. Uh, but the war was super destructive. So the first museum that I uh, mentioned was destroyed. It was next to a big uh, storage pile of ammunition which exploded. This ate half of the museum. If you go back to the building, you can see the destroyed bits of the thing and all the tiles have bullet marks with, still within them. And in a city like Krakow, uh, gov general government said, set their main uh, uh, headquarters in, former, uh, in a building that used to be geology department of Krakow University. Uh, they uh, moved the uh, swastika and the eagle at the place where it used to be Saint Barbara, who's the saint of the miners. Uh, and yeah, so basically not a very good place to do geology, especially when the geology didn't exist and pathology prior to that. But the war ended quite controversially and was handed over to the Soviet bloc and it became part of Stalinist uh, Polish People's Republic. Uh, and part of that uh, deal during Stalinism, uh, Poland was gifted a very large building in a uh, Moscow-style Seven Sister architecture, which is like Art Deco skyscraper, which meant to be the palace of culture and science, uh, which will come in, uh, to the play later. Also, in that time, Poland changed its borders, so we now had uh, bits of East Germany and uh, the model of the Baltic coast, which is a very phosphorus region. <coughs> All of those border chains are controversial and were quite brutal. Uh, but in the post-war uh, uh, period, uh, the uh, Polish uh, Pal Biological Institute was kick-started and proper vertebrate pathology started taking place. And it was going up and down because it was a very turbulent time politically, it changed its ideology with every single leader that came by. Uh, what was kind of uh, fascinating, although vertebrate pathology, there was inter during the interwar period and post-war period, where women, the, the pathology of uh, a lot of Eastern Europe, including Poland, was very feminine based. So one of the uh, first persons to accumulate all historic Polish texts on Polish geology was Regina uh, uh, Flasherowa, who also was a first Polish senator and women's rights activist. So a lot of people during that time were both politically involved and uh, scientists. Uh, you had uh, Period, period to war, we have a lot of people doing inter, in the, in, invertebrate, invertebrate research that was in the 1920s, 1930s. But things started uh, changing in the 60s and 70s, with vertebrate pathology gaining new life thanks to people like Halszko Smulska, Zofia Kielin Jawerowska, and Teresa Marinska, who were like three uh, uh, Indian Joneses of the time. They went to, to Polish Mongol expeditions. And with collaboration with Mongolian country, which was also a Soviet satellite state, 
helped excavate a lot of important fossils which revolutionized fields of paleontology. And since the 1990s, there were more paleontologists and paleoartists, including Martha Schubert, who works on most of paleo art artwork displayed in Polish museums, which is absolutely amazing. We're going to be seeing them later. Uh, and during the Polish uh, Mongol exhibitions, uh, expeditions, which were actually uh, legal, so there's no exploitation. The Mongolian government and Polish allowed to go simultaneously on the place. Both people had uh, rights to publish. Uh, the, there was a good trade-off. So a lot of uh, uh, things that were discovered stayed in Mongolia. Some of them were in Poland. Some things were just casted and sent to Poland. And there's a trade of things going back and forth between two countries still. So it was not a colonial exploitation, it was more like a collaboration between two institutions in which everybody was seen as equal, which is cool, and we should be doing it much, much more often, because that expedition brought so many fossils that are known globally, on, uh, like the famous Dano Kairos hands, which has, uh, has a, uh, still held in Mongolia, but has still got to be accessed as casts in Poland, and the famous Velcro after attacking uh, Potoceratops. Also, all the whole times were described of various ankylosaurids, bacillophrosaurids, oviraptorids, all the things in the 70s and 60s. Uh, that time also sparked a small dinosaur boom over the 60s and 70s with the opening of the first dinosaur museum in the Stalin's cultural palace and the uh, ex equivalent of uh, uh, Crystal Palace dinosaurs but made of concrete in Silesia region, which has a lot of fossils. Those ladies, in uh, addition to being expeditors, politicians, activists, also publish a lot. And they publish in both English and Polish, and were involved with research going from Eastern Bloc and also West. So they went to a lot of expeditions and uh, uh, collaborations with English and American authors, which is quite unforeseen during that turbulent period. Uh, so yeah, they were quite cool people, but because uh, things got complicated later, the, the generation didn't follow after that initial boom of the 60s, 70s Mongolian research, and it sort of petered cut it out uh, up until having current revival. Despite this, pantology sort of popped in and out in the Polish uh, the pop culture uh, in some famous uh, cartoons like Boliki Lolik, there's an, an uh, episode about expeditions in Mongolia, the, different cam the cameos of different preserving animals in, all, in uh, Eastern Bloc animated shows. Uh, but the overall knowledge of those things were quite limited. When you ask somebody from the 60s or 80s if they know that Poland had big push in dinosaur discoveries, they don't really know because people don't have good access to TV or books and communication between people, especially the regarding sciences, which is quite limited. Okay, so that's more or less about the history or the prehistory. Now let's get into uh, actual uh, paleontological aspect of Poland as it is now. All of Poland is quite uninteresting paleontologically because it was covered by ice, glacial, and now it's just all loess and sand covering it, uh, all the things. Uh, also, all the things is uh, created of East European platform, which is not very eventful fossil wise. But there's some small bits around the orogenic areas which are very interesting fossils. So interesting, in fact, many of them get nature publications, although as nature publications go, they're usually controversial and disputed. It's considered that the sets of numerous symmetrical tracks uh, found in Wojciechowice formation belong to the first animals that ever walked on the ground, uh, in the middle of the Bonian, being the earliest terrestrial animals. This comes with some kind of controversy because some people think they might be fish uh, uh, feeding traces. But the wonderful thing is, uh, there's a lot of them, and some of them have even small uh, toe prints preserved, so you can actually see how early uh, hands might have looked like. And they're adorable, look at them, you just want to high-five them, or you, they have more than five fingers, so high eight them? <laughs> uh, and here's a construction of them by uh, Martha uh, Schubert, of them just sort of crawling to, uh, on the land, because it has this all the debris of dead animals sort of being washed up by the waters, and they being opportunists, just moving out of war to get this uh, detritus sort of uh, on the land. What's kind of interesting, it's a uh, general pattern in paleontology, is that uh, Footprints predate the body fossils. It's a weird pattern. We see it in a lot of animals. That's the case in stegosaurids, in pterodactyloids, and that might also be the case with things like first dinosaurs. We don't have good evidence of early dinosaur ancestors on the per uh, after the Permo Triassic extinction, but there are some small things found in southern Poland again, pointing at maybe that small uh, ancestor of dinosaurs around that time. Uh, so that's more with more fossils in similar time as uh, type of just footprints predating body fossils, which happens interestingly a lot, and that might be due to uh, the fact that the uh, footprints are created in higher quantity 
than body fossils. Every, we as people create much, much more uh, footprints than we do bodies. We just create one skeleton, but leave hundreds of uh, footprints behind, making it more representative of the things that were alive rather than sometimes body fossils, if that makes sense. Now we are moving into Triassic, and that's the most famous uh, discovery and uh, location within the polar geology. Uh, there was an arid, inter uh, arid region which sort of fre frequently flooded, uh, killing a lot of animals within it. And we have hundreds and hundreds of specimens of various ontogenic groups of different animals capturing that environment. We even have the poop, and the poop is amazing, because you can see small, amazingly preserved beetle in one of the poop blocks. Uh, so whatever we ate them was not very good at uh, digesting insects. And over here is Silosaurus, uh, amazingly, um, uh, amazingly preserved, maybe basal dinosaur, maybe stilagarpid, experimental triassic thing, hard to tell. But, uh, that formation from the Crashia Youth uh, is a really a, a gold mine for 3D preserved triassic experimental weird reptiles and synapsids from enormous potato-shaped diseodonts to weird crocodile mimicking fetosauruses and very big, like uh, one meter, uh, half a meter big schools of things like Sikwasosaurus, and also controversial Ozemic, on which I'll be actually looking at, and other things that are might, might be basal dinosaurs or might be uh, Rosuchians, all that kind of types of archosaurs. Jurassic was a little less exciting. A lot of Poland was covered by waters with only some bits uh, being uh, uh, emerging from them. This means we have a lot of lovely ammonites, some marine reptiles, but a lot of uh, tertiary fossils. Despite this, there are some locations that yield hundreds of amazingly preserved dinosaur footprints and different kinds of footprints, from herbivores to carnivores, and even, even evidence of things like nesting sites. But it's still being unpublished, so look out for cool things coming from early uh, and late Jurassic from Poland, because there's some interesting critters that walked on the ground and left their footprints behind, and not only footprints. Uh, but I think that research is still under wraps, so just be on the lookout, there's something coming. Also, they have pterosaur footprints, and you know, I'm a pterosaur researcher, so I had to mention them. There's some scrappy pterosaur uh, material that might belong to pterosaurs, but the best things are unequivocal pterodactyloid footprints found across the country, and also uh, pterodactyloid uh, poop, which is great. I always love some pterosaur poop. Uh, but most things uh, regarding vertebrate things within the collection usually come from that 60s, 70s Mongolian expeditions, which were sort of dropped, uh, and there's a lot of Tarbosauruses, Gallimimids, and mammals still waiting for eager eyes to uh, describe them, because the research is kind of underfunded, uh, and there's a lot of stuff just waiting in the cupboards for somebody to take a look, uh, because there might be new species to discover, or new observations, hard to tell, have to, have to look, have to do a project. We're moving past the Mesozoic and going into Oligocene. So we're looking at the world that's looking very similar to the uh, it is now. Britain is still connected to Europe, which is not the case currently. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, enormous pa uh, Paratephys mega lake, which now just remains as the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. But uh, Poland bordered all of that uh, Oligocene deposits and deposited amazing fossils of fishes and uh, birds and other things uh, within the shallow marine uh, habitat. And they wonderfully preserved in hundreds, if not thousands. Suddenly, that formation is not very well known because it was discovered uh, mainly worked by, on by one single lady for months of its duration. And also, all the fossils were uh, uh, sort of excavated and exported to Germany, so all the Polish uh, researchers can't really access them. That's usually the case for the amazingly preserved birds. Uh, and there are some things within the collection that I absolutely love. Look, like, look at this small, amazing fish. And this enormous heron feather, that's such a lovely fossil, I love it so much. Why we don't have such amazing fossils of feathers from uh, the Mesozoic or Jurassic? Please, give us something like this. We also have my favorite, the very angry crab. You, can, you know he is Polish because he's so divided and so angry and he's flipping us off. <laughs> he came with a message and he's currently on display in the Warsaw Museum in the former Stalin Polish, if you want to say hello to him. Uh, and there's also a lot of cases of war and cannibalism. A lot of fishes are preserved eating other fishes, sometimes of the same species. The theory is they maybe just sort of started eating them, it got stuck and they died uh, just very unfaltering un death. There's also theory suggesting that it might be actually poisonous uh, by uh, of venomous. So the fish sort of ate it, uh, got stricken and died uh, because there's a lot of fossils dying with fish remains inside of them. So either uh, either uh, interpretation might work, 
but still, it's a family friend just spelled with Vore. If, if, if you are into this, that might be interesting, because nobody really looks at it in a pretty, in a pretty long time, and there's a lot of Vore stuff going around if you're into this elegant scene things. I think the most popular thing coming from Poland, but not just Poland, just general Baltic area, actually the most uh, frequent, most uh, amber, which I'm going to be talking about, comes from uh, Kaliningrad, which is part of detached Russia, which used to be Konigsberg, which used to be Germany. It's a little bit complicated, but they do like industrial level excavations of uh, Baltic amber. And the amber is amazing. It's coming from Eocene and has bits of uh, reptiles, bits of mammals, but maybe mainly insects and uh, uh, flora. Uh, look at the small gecko. It's so. Look at its tiny eyes. It's adorable, uh, and the entire Baltic uh, co uh, seaway uh, sort of expels that eosinic things uh, on the coast. That means if you go for fossil hunting for Baltic amber, you don't go chiseling in the ground like in a desert. You get a big net. You go in the winter. We the tide the tide is high, and you search for small red rocks. Uh, which might have inclusions in them, which are quite relatively rare compared to them. And uh, early Slavic people traded Baltic amber on mass scale. They even traded with China, and that's how they uh, collaborated with actually early uh, uh, Qin dynasty, which is quite, kind of cool. Uh, and they had entire uh, Baltic road going for the country uh, that was in the medieval times. But look at amazing things you can find in it. I know this is a vertebrate, vertebrate talk, but look at, look at the invertebrates. And look at the small mushroom, adorable mushroom. It's just a centimeter big. It's like a theoretical mushroom shape. And uh, if we're coming to Eastern Europe, everybody knows about mammoths. We have a lot of mammoths uh, generally uh, coming from the following things. Sadly, Poland doesn't have permafrost to have uh, things preserved in with soft tissue, but we have a lot of skeletons and a lot of evidence of mammoth hunting. Uh, and uh, general hu uh, human migrations of the uh, corridor from the Danube Valley. We also have evidence of the tall, biggest European uh, elephant, the Palo <laughs> Paloloxodon Antiquus, who was four meters big, so he has two stories tall, and you can see it in the museum, <laughs> just be showcasing its enormous Lord of the Rings type of size. It was discovered in a coal, uh, coal quarry, so they were searching for coal as they do in Poland and came across those enormous limb bones, which are bigger than any of any other uh, elephant. If I saw something like this, I was like, oh, that's a weird serpent looking thing. <laughs> and there's some living fossils in a way. So there were uh, bisons were roaming the Eurasian and American realm in the Holocene, but when the uh, 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 sea levels rose, the corridors uh, sort of flooded, and the uh, migration between two things sort of stopped. The uh, bisons, or the European uh, equivalent of bisons, was hunted quite severely across Europe, but they were considered holy and protected by under the monarchy, allowed them to be uh, still alive and not extinct within that region. Uh, in the recent history, there is a lot of push for preservation of the Białowieża Pleistocenic forest, a very ancient forest, one of the oldest in Europe, and the now uh, Rub, or the bison, is no longer in uh, and, and the endangered. So if you want to see, see live, uh, living Eisage megafauna in wild, thriving, just doing great, Poland is a great place. Sadly, Białowieża forest is currently during undergoing quite complicated political on environmental and human uh, rights issue with uh, uh, barring of migrants coming from the Belarus. So it's a very controversial topic and sadly both humans and people within that very precious environment are being uh, hurt for uh, no reason whatsoever. And talking about prehistoric pop culture, Polish po modern pop culture goes frequently back into uh, the worship of its pantology. The rub uh, or the bison appears a lot in advertising and he's an icon for alcoholic drinks. Of course, here Poland, there has to be something related to alcohol. Uh, so here's one of the reconstruction of Prezub, which is amazing to be like alcohol ad, but do having great paleo art to go with it. And also, uh, this uh, animation, culture animation is still in a small revival. Uh, recently, there was an uh, animated short by, in Love, Death and Robots, developed by a Polish company, which has all of prehistoric animals, some of which you can find as fossils in Poland. And I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, it's 20 minutes. It's not a lot to you know, cover history of Earth and history of one complicated country. But I hope that sparked your imagination. If you want to know something about joining fossil digs in Poland, visiting collections, or learning more about its complicated history, please reach out to me. I'm more, eager, uh, more than eager to help. And I, will, I, will, I would love to give you some 
uh, dinosaur themed pierogies, but I cannot send them online. Yeah, technology is not there, so just imagine me sending good pierogi vibes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think that's everything. <laughs> Thank you. Thank okay. you very much, Natalia. Uh, we are unfortunately one minute over time, so no time for questions. But if you have questions, you can still uh, put them into our uh, questions and answers channels uh, for Natalia to see.